Okay, so we are good today. It's being recorded. And then we'll look for this class. And... Hmm. I just go ahead and drag that tab over here. All right, so today we're going to start on a new topic, uh, which means you know you might want to create a new entry in your notes, you know because it is a new topic. We are going to talk about this is what we did last time: compiling C control structures. That's what we did before the exam, and what we're going to do today is to go to calling and returning from subroutines. So that's what we're going to do today. We have a companion lab activity today as well. So, you know, taking notes, you know, during the lecture can be helpful with your lab activity. So here we go. We're going to get started here. All right. And for some reason, it's not going for the HTTP connection. Okay, well, it's not a big deal. All right. So today's focus is, you know, how do you call and return from a subroutine in TTP ASM? That is the one topic that we're going to go over today. But before we go over that topic, the first thing we need to do is to understand what a stack is. If you have taken CISP 430 already, you should know what a stack is. If you have not taken CISP 430, don't worry. I will introduce the concept of a stack, or otherwise known as first in, first out, or last in, first out, sorry. A stack is a last in, first out kind of construct. So we'll go ahead and start with that. And there will be a sample program that I'm going to implement in TTP ASM today. This is the program that I'll be implementing. But before we do anything like that, then we'll do a little short digression to what a stack is. So a stack is basically what we call a last in, first out structure, um, which basically means the last thing that you put into it is the first thing that you retrieve. So the best example of a last in, first out thing in real life is when you go to buffet places, they usually have a stack of plates, right? So those plates are, um, organized in a last in first out fashion. In other words, the very last plate that the server, the last clean plate that they put on the stack is the first one that the customers is gonna take out of the stack. Does that make sense to you? So at the end of the day, okay, there may be some you know, plates all the way at the bottom of the stack that has not been used. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's last in, first out. And if you want some additional examples of what is last in, first out in real life, is a U-Haul truck, okay, or a truck for moving. The very last item that you push, you know, before you slam the tailgate, you shut, is the first thing that's going to fall out of the truck when you open it. And some of you are transferring, you know, this summer, and you'll have that experience that last, the bicycle that you kind of push in and then someone else is going to slam the tailgate, it's going to be the first thing that falls out of the truck. And I hope you won't make the mistake of putting the map to the new campus as the first thing that you put into the truck because you know, you're not going to get able to get back to it for a while. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, another last in first out thing that really should not be last in first out is your refrigerator. Now, I'm, some of you are really good at making sure that you finish all the old food before you buy anything new or you kind of keep the new food to the back of the fridge, but most of us don't, right? So what do you do? You have all the old moldy food at the back of the refrigerator because all the new stuff is at the front of the refrigerator. When you open the fridge and go like, oh, I need a stack, are you going to take out everything out and then go all the way to the back and say, oh, that has an expiration date of tomorrow. I got to use that first. No, you just kind of go like, hmm, the first item, that's what I want. And then leave everything in the back of the refrigerator to mold and, you know, to go bad. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so we have all of these last in first out structure in real life. So now the question is, how does that relate to programming? So we'll we'll address that once we kind of talk about the implementation of a stack first. So the the stuff that we want to put onto the stack and retrieve from the stack, we'll just say that everything that we want to store and retrieve from the stack are unsigned A-bit integers. In other words, a byte, okay? So everything is a byte. We want to store a byte of content that is a byte called A-bit wide and to retrieve content that is also A-bit wide. So that becomes the quantum of you know, what we can store and retrieve from the stack. Is that concept okay? Okay, all right. So now we are gonna go through some C code. So the first chunk of the C code is going to define a few things. Uh, the first one is simply a macro definition, which most people don't use anymore. Most people just use a const these days to define constants. <clears throat> but in the older you know, versions of C and C++, you know, there are no constants. So a macro is the only way to define a constant. So in this case, you know, whenever the C compiler sees your stack size, it is going to say, oh, okay, you mean 32. Okay, so stack size, all uppercase, is nothing more than the symbolic name of the quantity of 32, or well, that's the best way you can look at it in this context. <clears throat> the next line is defining a global variable called stack, and it contains 32 bytes. Is that okay? So none of this should be new to you because you all come from CISP 360. So this is just a concept of declaring an array that has 32 bytes. And then the last one is a pointer to an unsigned A-bit integer. It's called SP. SP is the abbreviation of stack pointer. So we're gonna refer to the name or the term stack pointer quite a bit in this class from this point onward, so you might want to kind of pay attention to what a stack pointer is. So are there any questions about these three lines of code? What they mean, you know, you don't, even though we don't know what they're gonna use for, you know, do we understand the declarations? Yes? Um, no, it is going to be implicit. So when we transition from the C code to assembly code, then I will tell you where the stack really is and what is the size, quote unquote, size of the stack. Okay. So now, <clears throat> so we now explain what a stack is and what is a stack pointer. Note how the stack pointer, okay, not point, pointer is declared as a pointer to an element in the stack array. In TTP, we assume the stack is from location 255, which is the last location, to the last byte available after the program takes up space. So it's a little bit harder to see right now, so we'll kind of defer the visualization of this part until a little bit later. We also have to designate a register to be the stack pointer. For the rest of this discussion, we assume register D is the stack pointer. In other words, in here, in the C code, I'm using a particular variable called stack pointer to act as, quote unquote, the stack pointer. But when you are in TTP, there's no dedicated stack pointer. We are gonna use register D as the stack pointer you know, in TTP ASM, okay? But none of that is important right now because we just want to look at stack-related operations from the perspective of C++ code first then we will transition to TTP ASM and ask, how do we do the same thing in TTP ASM? All right, to facilitate the efficient use of instructions, a stack grows down instead of up. I know it sounds kind of awkward, you know, but when you look at the examples, you know, it will be clear. This means as more items are added to the stack, the stack pointer moves down instead of up. Okay, so it's a little bit counterintuitive but it is for good reasons. Because the stack pointer is assumed to be pointing to the last item stored, which is also called pushed. When you store an item on the stack, it is the same thing as pushing an item on the stack. The code to store something new is as follows. 
So we, now we have two lines of code to store something. So we assume that X is representing what you want to store, okay? It's kind of like, okay, hold on to this. I will need this back later, okay? That's what X is. X is the, the value that you want to save. So the first thing we need to do is to decrement the stack pointer. So the stack pointer will go one location lower than what it used to be. And then at that location, the new location, we store um, X, which is a value, to whatever the stack pointer is pointing to. So is that okay? You know, I, I just want to make sure people understand what each line is doing, but how they connect to the whole concept of a stack. You know, we, we, there are some more items that I need to go over before we kind of get the whole picture. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yep. So high memory location is at the top. Low memory location is at the bottom. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So to retrieve an item, you know, then we do basically the opposite. To retrieve an item, you know, that is already stored on the stack, the right-hand side of the assignment is asterisk sp, which means you know, we are dereferencing sp as a pointer and retrieve what it's pointing to. Whatever it's pointing to is now stored in X, which is the thing that is going to store whatever value we are retrieving from the stack. But once you retrieve an item from the stack, it is no longer, quote unquote, useful on the stack. So this is how we reclaim that spot on the stack that was used to store the value that we just retrieved. Is that okay? So the first one, okay, you know, if you look at the first two lines of code here, that is the same thing as a server, you know, coming from the kitchen area and start to put clean plates on the stack of plates. The bottom two lines of code is a customer going to the stack of clean plates and get a, one of the clean plates, you know, in order to, you know, put food on it. So one is for adding more items on the stack. The other one is for removing items from the stack. Is that okay so far? So I know the concepts may be a little bit vague right now, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do a C program, okay? We'll, we'll use online GDB and actually put this code to work, and then we'll try to figure out what is it going to retrieve after you know, certain operations. And then the very last line that we need to talk about before we can have a sample program is to is basically how do we initialize the stack pointer. This is how we initialize the stack pointer because as I said a little bit earlier, the stack grows down, which means the initial value of the stack pointer has to point to one location past the end of the entire stack. Because we, why? because we decrement the stack pointer first before we make use of the location that it points to. So that means you know, we have to initialize the stack pointer to point past the very last byte of the stack. Because you know, using that particular way, then the first item, the first thing we do when we want to push something on the stack is to decrement it, which means after that decrement, then it points to the very last location on the stack which is available to us to store something. All right, so what we'll do now is what we're gonna to go to online GDB and run some code. Because I think that will kind of clarify some of the questions that you have in your mind, on your mind. So we'll go ahead and we'll change up this program, okay? And specify just regular C is fine, this is nothing Fancy, so regular C is going to be okay. And I typically like to use standard integer dot H so that I can refer to integers you know, by the width of the integers. So I will do exactly the same thing as what I did earlier in the text. I will declare, um, oh, I need to know the size of the stack first. So we'll do a pound defined stack size to be 32, which is a really tiny stack you know, for this uh, as an example. So we'll say 32, and there we go. And then u in 8 underscore t, uh, this is the actual stack. It has um, stack size many items. 
semicolon. There we go. And then u in eight underscore t. This is the actual stack corner. So this is main. And now I'm going to go through a bunch of push and a bunch of pop operation. A push operation is to store something. A pop operation is to retrieve something. Go ahead. It has the space to store 32 8-bit values. Yep, so we are talking about values, not functions. The concept of a function is built on top of the concept of a stack, but we are not quite there yet. So we are only concerned about the stack operations, which is only useful for, hey, hold on to this, remember this, I might need to you know, retrieve that later. Okay, but the idea is, you know, what is last in first out? So we're gonna demonstrate that concept. So the first thing I wanna do is to push a value of, okay, this is all completely random value, say 45, okay? So how do I store 45 here on the stack? Uh, oh, before we do this, we have to initialize the stack pointer. I almost forgot that. So SP as a stack pointer is gonna be stack plus stack size. Okay, so what does that do exactly? This statement on the right-hand side is exactly the same as referring to the address of one location past the end of the entire stack. So it is really the same thing as doing, oops, this. The right-hand side of line nine is the same as the comment of the same line. So how many people learned this in your C++ class that you can perform arithmetic with pointers? Okay, very good. The rest of you, did you not remember or do you think it was never taught? Well, it's okay, now you're taught. So basically, if you use a pointer as if it is an array, whatever number you add to it, is going to refer to the address of the element at that particular index. So that's why you know, stack plus stack size is the address of the element at index stack size, which does not exist. Why, why did I say that? What is the index of the last element of stack as an array? Stack size minus one, and why is that? The first element has an index of zero. Very good, okay. So now that we got that clarified, now we can say, uh, I want the stack to remember 45 for whatever strange reason. So the first thing we need to do is, decrement dec is to decrement the stack pointer, and then the next thing we need to do is to say whatever the stack pointer points to at this point is gonna be the 45, the value that I want to store. And let's say we want to push another value, let's say 32, okay, for no particular reason. So once again, we decrement the stack pointer, and then whatever the stack pointer points to is now gonna get the value of 32. Uh, let's push one more thing. So we're gonna push, uh, let's say 57 on the stack. Same thing, decrement the stack pointer, and at whatever the stack pointer is pointing to, now we store 57. Are we doing okay so far with these six lines of code? So they are consistent with what I said a little bit earlier, except that these are concrete, because I want to retrieve 45, 32, and 57, respectively. Are we good so far? Okay. So now we want to retrieve items, okay? So when I retrieve, you know, instead of you know, putting those in a register, I can print them out, okay? So let's go ahead and figure out how to print out those particular values. And this can get a little bit tricky, but I think I can get it, I can get it done. So how do we retrieve again? Well, to retrieve something, we refer to what, where the stack one is pointing to, so typically, what you want to do is to say x equals to whatever the stack pointer points to. That's, that's how we retrieve it. But since I want to print it out without storing that to a particular variable, I can now you know, use printf directly and specify 
um, percent u as an unsigned integer with a line feed, and now I can say u in 30, uh, int just unsigned, uh, whatever I'm retrieving, which is whatever the stack point is pointing to. And it's giving me red here because I have not pound included the standard input output. So that's what I'm going to do here, fix that, stdio.h. Most of you probably do not use your know, printf, you know, because you know how to use C out. It's kind of the same thing. All right, so this is helping me to retrieve the last value that I push on the stack. But the second operation that I need to perform is to increment the stack pointer. The increment of the stack pointer is basically saying, okay, we have just retrieved the value of this item. I don't need that on the stack anymore. So the stack pointer can go up by one item to basically identify if somebody is to retrieve an item again, it's going to be that item. So I'm not going to retrieve the same item over and over again. Yes? Uh, STDIO, standard input output, dot H. Yep. <clears throat> OK, so I will you know, push yet another item on the stack. OK, so we're going to push, uh, let's say, you know, 15 on the stack right now, minus, minus SP. Uh, whatever SP is pointing to is going to be 15 this time. And then I will print whatever is on top of the stack like twice in a row. Okay, so we'll do it twice in a row. And we'll just kind of say we are good. Okay, so this is the end of the program. So now the question is, what do you think it is going to print? It is using what we call the last in first out order. The last thing that you put in is the first wing, the first one that you retrieve, and you can only retrieve an item once. Okay, once it is retrieved, it's not on the stack anymore. So, what do you think this program is going to print? Go ahead. That is correct. Okay. So we'll go ahead and run the program first, okay? Just to make sure that it, that's the order of how it's going to print your know, things. So we'll go ahead and go to debug. Oh, okay, I have, oh, for typecasting, I forgot to put the parentheses around the type because typecasting requires you know, the parentheses. We can just name the type. Okay, we'll fix all of those. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run the program again. Debug. All right, so I forgot a semicolon here. What else is it complaining about? Another print F. Oh, that's just because of the missing semicolon. That was it. Okay, let's do it one more time. Woohoo, it runs this time. And we just have to say R. And it prints exactly your know, 57, 15, and 32. Very good. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions. There are no questions, okay, but is that, yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's a good question, and I will answer that question with comments. Okay. So the way I answer that question is to indicate how the array should look like, you know, at each point after each operation. So at this point, you know, the array is going to have a whole bunch of items that are not used, and then 45 is the last item on the, in the entire array. At this point, we will have a bunch of items that are not used, and then we have 32, then we have 45. 45 is the last item in the entire array. And then at this point, we have 57, oops, 
57, 32, and 45 is still the last item. Now, it is probably helpful to understand you know, what the stack pointer is pointing at. So I'm going to use parentheses to surround the item that is pointed to by the stack pointer. When we only have one, one item point, you know, pushed on the stack, that has to be the item pointed to by the stack pointer because you know, part of what the st stack pointer does is to point to the last thing we push on the stack. But when we push the second item on the stack, the stack pointer will now be pointing to the second item that we just pushed. And then we will be pushing, after we push the third item, that's what's going to happen. Now, when we pop, okay, to retrieve an item from the stack is also called a pop operation. So after we pop, the 57 is technically still on the stack, but the stack pointer is incremented. So now it is pointing to the 32 that we pushed a little bit earlier. And then when we push 15 again here, it's going to reuse the space that was 57. So at this point, we would have 15, 32, and 45, but the stack pointer will be pointing to the 15. In other words, the 15 is overriding the location that was earlier you know, storing 57. Is that okay? All right. And, um, well, might as well do the rest. So after this, we have retrieved yet another item. So the 15 will still be on the stack, but now the stack pointer points to the 32, and then 45 is still here. And then at this point, um, we would have 15, 32 still sitting on the stack, but the stack pointer will now be pointing to the 45. But the 45, we never did anything with it. We never retrieved it. It's still on the stack. Is that OK? All right. So I can share this program with the entire class, OK, just in case you guys want to run this code and line by line to understand what is happening after each line executes. So let me go ahead and sign in, and then I can share a link to this code. So let me go to sign in, log in. I probably don't want to do that. Okay. So I'll just do this and hmm, I'm just trying to figure out where the class page is located. There we go. All right, so it's on the page that you cannot see for some reason, but I will put it into announcements. Okay, so in one in the last announcements, it'll it'll be the code that you're just looking at. And Canvas is being really slow, so I'll remember to do that. And probably store this program in a local file so I don't lose it. So give me a second to get that done. Okay. So I have the program stored locally because uh, Canvas is not responding uh, for some reason. Oh, terrific. That's okay. It's not going to slow us down, is it? Because I got everything stored here. <laughs> and I can compile the code you know, locally. So we'll look at this program, pushpop.c. So what if, where do you think the stack pointer is? right at the return zero point. The, the stack pointer should still be pointing at something. So the question is, what is it pointing at? I'll give you like three choices. 
It's pointing at the very beginning of stack as an array. It's pointing to the very last element of stack as an array. Or it is pointing to one element just past the end of stack as an array. Yes? Mm -hmm. OK, look at the picture here. <laughs> the stack pointer points to you know, the thing that is in parentheses. The 45 is the last item in the array. So when we get to the return statement, the stack pointer is pointing to the very last element in stack as, a, as an array, otherwise known as stack in square bracket 31. Because the stack has 32 items, so the last item has an index of 31. All right, so now how do we do this? Okay, you know, I, I'm assuming the internet has not resumed. Yep, it's still down, Wi-Fi is still down. So we can go ahead and just run this code locally. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do this locally. Um, right. So we'll go ahead and gcc-g-o push pop, and then the name of the source code, gdb push pop, like so. And it's complaining about something. Okay, so something is not right here. Let me double check. Dash G is to de include debug information. So that should be correct. Then what is it complaining about? All right, auto loading, save path. Oh, okay, I see what it's complaining. That's fine. It's just you know, the format. It's a formatting issue you know, because uh, the color coding in GDB makes it a little bit difficult for the class to read, so I had to turn off you know, the color syntax highlighting, basically. So it's still working fine, not a problem. All right, so we are going to go all the way to the end of this code and put a breakpoint on line 45. So we run the code all the way to line 45, and the question is, what is the stack pointer pointing to? Okay, so we'll say, okay, stack pointer, tell me what you are. So we go like, oh, that's not very helpful, is it? Because all this is telling us is, you know, the stack pointer is pointing to a location of, you know, five, 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 blah, 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 and it ends with five F. That's what, that doesn't tell me anything. But I can also look at the address of various items on the, you know, in the stack array. So this tells me the location of st the first item in stack. This tells me the location of the second item in the stack. And this tells me the location of the last item on the stack as an array. And you go like, oh, but that's exactly the same. You know, SP, the stack pointer, is pointing to the last element of array stack, which is exactly what I said a little bit earlier. So are we, are we OK with this so far? OK. So are we? Are there any questions regarding the concept of a stack? The last is last in, first out. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. I'm. Can you repeat the question? I'm not understanding the question itself. Um, no, you're not supposed to. <laughs> you can adjust the stack pointer any way, any way you want, okay? But the proper operation of the stack has to be done by either a push operation, which is adding an item, you know, storing an additional item on the stack, or a push up or a pop operation, which is retrieving an item, a value on the stack. So doing anything else to the stack pointer is not, uh, quote unquote part of the primitive of stack operation. So yes, you can do that, you know, but it is um, usually not a good idea. Okay. So are we okay so far? You know, are there any other questions about stack related operations? No. Okay, all right, so if there are no additional questions about the stack operation, 
I will continue to try to reconnect to the internet. It looks like it's still out, but that's okay. You know, I can continue to teach the class. Worst come to worst, you know, I just have to hand assemble the program that I need to talk about, which is going to be fun. <laughs> but before we do that, okay, there's one more thing we need to do, which is to make sure that you guys understand you know, what is calling and what is returning from a function. So a lot of times I use the word subroutine, which is basically the same thing as a function. Okay, so it's just a different programming languages refer to the same concept with different names. So now we're going to go to the program that we looked at a little bit earlier, um, and we'll go to call example. And that was a C program. So we have a fairly kind of not useful program because I have a function called f that doesn't do a single thing. Then we have main, and in main we call f twice, and then main itself returns to you know, this, the, the system. So in this particular case, um, what is the flow of the program? In other words, if I want you to tell me what lines we get to, you know, from, you know, the, uh, from main, what is the first line that we get to? That's pretty easy. What is the first line in main? Line seven, okay. And then from line seven, where do we go? We go to line one, two, or three, doesn't matter, because you know, the function is empty, it doesn't do a single thing. And then where does it go? Eight, very good, okay. So we don't get back to line seven, because that would make it kind of, it's not a loop per se, but it does, it would, it's gonna just do that you know, indefinitely. So we do have to return to line eight, okay, after the first call to F. Then, and then where do we go? We go back to line you know, one, two, or three. Doesn't matter which line you quote. And then what? And then it goes to line nine, and then that concludes the execution of this program. Okay, very good. So we do understand the concept of calling and returning. The trick is, what do we do to get it done? The calling part is not a problem. Like from line seven to line one, it's not a problem. Which instruction can do this already? A JMPI, right? A JMPI goes like, oh, you want me to continue execution at F? Not a problem, okay? We just go to that label. Um, same thing with uh, from line eight to line one, another JMPI instruction is gonna get a job done. The tricky part is after we are done with F, okay, from line three, per, you know, let's just say line three, where, how do we go from line three to line eight the first time? and then go from line three to line nine the second time. A JMPI cannot do that because a JMPI always go to the same location because the I stands for immediate, which is a constant. So JMPI cannot go to different places depending on something. So this is when we need to refer, this is when we need to use a different, you know, uh, jump instruction is called JMP without the I. So the JMP without the I, okay, this is, you know, I'm going to use comment here. So JMP without the I requires a register. So you can use one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D, as the operand to the JMP instruction. But what this does is something that is, that is, it's really simple. All it does, okay, if you look at the RTL of this thing, all it does is to say, hey, program counter, why don't you just update yourself to be whatever that specified register is? So this allows us to alter where the JMP instruction is going to go based on runtime things. Okay, what are runtime things? The values of registers is a runtime thing. The content of memory is a runtime thing because all of those can change as your program execute as opposed to the immediate value of JMPI, that is not supposed to change during runtime. Now, I said not supposed to, meaning that, yeah, you can change it. It's just a very, very bad practice to do that. All right? But this alone is not gonna help us, right? Because this alone 
it's going to go like, okay, so we can have a JMP R, JMP A or JMP B or JMP C, or, but we cannot have JMP D because D is dedicated as the stack pointer. So we can have something like this on line three or to implement line three of the C code. The problem is, um, then what kind of value are we going to stick into register A? How do we know that we have to stick the address of line eight the first time and to, to put a value corresponding to the address of line nine the second time? That becomes the new question. Is that kind of, uh, is everybody understanding you know, the, the problem that we're having? How do we know where to go back to when a function is done executing? So who do you think knows where that location should be? Well, the stack is used, but in terms of the caller versus the callee, okay, callee is the function being called. So in terms of the caller versus the callee, who knows exactly where the callee is supposed to return to? The caller, right? So that means, hey, if the caller has a mechanism to say, okay, I am going to t remember this location and communicate this to the callee and say, hey, callee, when you're done, go back to this spot for to continue execution, then that'll be all good. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is exactly why we talk about the stack, because the stack is the mechanism to do that. Before you call, before you continue execution with a callee, what you do is you, you remember where the callee is supposed to return to on the stack. Okay, so let me double check and see if the, oh, internet is back, so we can actually run this code. All right, so now we're gonna translate this code into assembly code. So I'm gonna do a vertical split of the screen split I think that's automatically a horizontal split so we have to do a V split there we go and then on this side I'm gonna uh, edit the TTP ASM of the program so we'll call this call return .ttp ASM all right the first thing we need to do at the very beginning of the program is a no op because I'm gonna run this through using refer spider so that I can look at the trace of this code Okay, and then what we'll do is to initialize the stack pointer. Oh, how should we initialize the stack pointer? The stack pointer is supposed to be pointing to one location past the end of the space that we allocate as the stack. So the first question is, um, so where is the stack? The stack is everything other than the code of your program. In other words, once you assemble a program, all the space that is not used by the assembled program is the stack. At least you know, in TTPSM, that is the case. Yes? You don't need to make a label at the end because we know where the end is. So where is the end of the memory space of the TTP architecture? Sorry? 255. But we don't want 255 as the value of the stack pointer because we want the one location after that. So this would seem to be a very stupid question. What is 255 plus one? Good job. <laughs> it is a zero because all the addresses can only be eight bit numbers, okay? And 255 is the last unsigned value when you only have eight bits. So when you add one to it, it becomes quote unquote 256, but everything is congruent modulo 256. So that means 256 is the same as zero. So that means you know, in order to initialize the stack pointer, this is how you do it. Because you know, we have already talked about how register D is now dedicated as the stack pointer. So initialize register D to zero is initializing the stack pointer. Yep. No, the no op has to do with a bug in uh, Logisim. <laughs> so 
Mm -hmm. Yes, but remember, you have to decrement first before you store something. So by the time you store something, it would have been 255 already. So that's why the ordering of the operation is very important. You always decrement first before you store to where the stack point is pointing to. All right, so now we look into the uh, C code and we implement F first. So the implementation of a function is rather easy. Whatever name I use in the C code is the same name in TTP ASM code. So we preserve the name of the function. Main is main, F is F, and so on. Okay, so that part is pretty easy. And if you want to say, okay, let's, let's just you know, emphasize that F has nothing to do, fine, let's stick a no op here, you know, just so that we know that it doesn't do a single thing. And then we have to stick some code here to say return to the caller, but we, we don't quite know what to do yet, okay, at this point. So I'm gonna skip over this code and then come back and fix it later. And then now we have main, but then we also need a JMPI to main because otherwise, if without the line, without JMPI on line three, what is the program going to do after line two? It goes to F, which is not what we want. So main is the entry point of the entire program. And that's why we have to say, oh, don't do anything just right after the initialization of the stack pointer. Make sure you go to main because that is the designated entry point of the entire program. Are we good so far? So does everybody understand why line three is necessary? Now, if you put main like where F is, then you don't need the JMPI to main, but I want to preserve the order of the definition of the functions, and that's why you know, I, be need, I need that JMPI to main, because I want to preserve the order of the definition of the functions. Okay, so when we're in main, now do, don't copy this, okay, because I'm gonna, put additional items in here and stuff like that, you, know, you can write down the concept, but don't write down the code, okay? So at some point, okay, in order to implement line seven, I'm gonna have a JMPI to F, okay? That's an easy one. So this way I can continue execution to the entry point of the function F, that's easy. The difficult part is before I do this, I have to somehow remember where the function the subroutine is supposed to return to. Huh. So instead of doing the counting myself and do all that accounting thing, I'm just gonna put a label here and say, you know, first call to F returns here. Talk about self-documenting code. That is pretty self-documenting. So this, the purpose of this label on line 10 at this point is simply to give that address a symbolic name and say, yeah, this is where I want the first call of F to return to. Are we good so far? You go like, okay, cool label, kind of long, but how are we gonna make use of this? So the way we make use of this label is to use it before JMPIF, before we continue execution at F, we kind of have to say, okay, let's remember this, okay? Because you know, the function needs this to return to the right spot. But how do we remember something? Stack operation. Are we popping or are we pushing on the stack? We're pushing because pushing is to store a value on the stack. Very good. So now the question is, how do we push that on the stack? Okay, we know what we want to do. So we want to push first call to F returns here on the stack. The question is, how do we do it? Well, let's go back and revisit how we do this in C first, and then we'll try to translate that into assembly code. In C, what do we do? Okay, you guys should know by now. I think you should have it in your notes right now. In C or C++, how do we push something on the stack? Decrement the stack pointer, okay, very good. Okay, so we have a stack pointer decrement, and then what? Whatever the stack pointer points to, 
is going to store the value that I want to remember, right? So that would be whatever first call to f returns here as a label. So are we doing okay so far with the C code in comments, which is refer which I'm saying which I'm referring to as line 10 and line 11 at this point? which is what I want to do, okay? We have not implemented that in assembly code just yet, but that's what we, want, what we need to do. Are we good so far? Because this is how we, quote unquote, remember where the function, once it's done, where it's supposed to return to, this is how we rem remember that. In other words, this is how we leave a crumb of bread behind so that we know how to get back. Is that okay? All right. All right. So now we try to you know, implement this in assembly. We know the stack pointer is register D. How do I decrement register D? That was a poorly thought of your question <laughs> because the question answers itself. Decrement D. <laughs> That's why I said the question was poorly formed, you know, because how do we decrement the, how do we decrement the stack corner? We decrement the register representing the stack corner. So that would be DEC decrement register D. That's all we need. Okay, what about the next one? We have one single op, well, we don't have a single opcode that can do this. You have to break, up, break it up into two opcodes. Now, you would say, well, but I thought we have a way to store something into what a register is pointing to. It's called ST, right? So we can use something like this. Ah, but when you look at the syntax highlighting, it is still telling me that this is not, this is no good. Why is this no good? What do you need for the ST instruction? Two registers, very good, okay? You need one register to serve as the pointer to RAM, to a location in RAM, which is where you want to store the value. But you need the value to also be specified by a register. Potentially the same register, you know, very seldom we would do that, but it has to be a register. First call to F returns here is not a register. It is a label. A label is nothing more than a symbolic name that translates to a particular number. Ah, that's not gonna work. So what we need to do is to put that value into a register first. So we need an LDI instruction here and say, well, you pick one of the registers that are available, which would be, would be at this point, register A, B, or C, okay? Pick one. Yeah, let's pick register C, okay, fine. First call to F returns here. Whew. Okay, so now that register C has the same value as the label, I can now do a STDC to store whatever register C has, which is basically just the label of first call to F returns here, and then we store that to what the stack pointer points to. So this is how we push the return address on the stack. Yes? Yes, yep, or whatever is gonna be right after this label definition. Yep, all right, so, okay, cool. So the second call to F is gonna be about the same thing. So instead of, so I'm gonna do some lazy work here. So I'm gonna put a, a line 13 to line 16, copy to line 16. All right, and I just have to change one thing and go like this is the, where the second call to F, second call to F returns here. Done with the second here call. Or are we? This is actually one of the bad idea of, this is why copy and paste is not good. If the program is like this, what, what do you think it's gonna do? Sorry? I made a mistake. It's gonna, so the second function call is also going to return to the first call to F returns here, which means it will just keep doing this indefinitely. 
okay, which is not good, right? So how should I fix the program? Change which line to second? Line 17, that is correct. So this should change to, oops, okay, I don't mean to delete the entire thing. This has to be changed to the second call returns here. All right. So after the second call to second call to F returns here, that concludes the whole program. I'm going to put a halt here. All right. So I have done everything that needs to be done from the perspective of the call. Oh, I forgot a few things. I forgot one thing. Sorry, I forgot one thing. So when you look at line 17 to line 19, I forgot one thing. What is it? What did I forget? This is supposed to be pushing the return address? The decrement D. Yep, I forgot the decrement D here. Because we're pushing again. All right. So now the question is, the, uh, our focus is now shifted to the subroutine or the function. So the function goes like, okay, I got nothing to do, great. Now I need to return to the caller. How, how am I supposed to find out where to return to the caller? So you go like, oh, why don't you just use register C and do a JMPC, that, you're done. Well, yes, in this particular example, that will get the same thing done. But generally speaking, we don't know which register contains the return address. If you're pushing something on the stack, how are you supposed to retrieve that? A pop, right? You, know, you, you need a pop operation. So that means in the subroutine here, in terms of C code or stack operation, we need to pop the return address to a register. Okay. And remind me, how do we pop a return value? How, how do we pop a value from the stack? It's exactly the reverse of a push operation. So how do you reverse the push operation? Can you find me the push operation somewhere on the screen right now? Line 12 and line 14. So you have to reverse that. So you have to first do the exact reverse of line 14, followed by the exact reverse of line 12. So the first thing we need to do is to reverse line 14 which is, you know, we're going to use a register. I'm just calling it called register X, and it's going to be whatever the stack pointer points to. And then we are going to increment the stack pointer. That's what we want to do in C++. But how do we do this in, so let's make a, a specific register here. Let's say register B. So how do we do this in TTP ASM? <coughs> Which instruction is useful here? Load, very good. Okay, you guys know your stuff. So we need a load instruction, and how do we make the use, how do we specify the operands? B. You don't have SP. SP is which register? It's register D. There we go. And then how do we just add one to the stack pointer? Increment. That's right, okay. So at this point on line 12, the return address is where? We have just retrieved it, but where, where did we put it after the retrieval? In register B, very good. So register B now has the address of where we are supposed to go back to, and we just need one thing to say, hey, program counter, why don't you just take whatever register B has? Because that's where we need to continue execution. Which instruction is that again? JMP without the I, B. Very good. So we have a JMP B just like that. And now the entire program is done. All right, are we okay for the most part? Looking at the source code can be difficult to understand what it actually does. So the best way to really understand the code is to run it and look at the result of running this code. Okay, question? Yeah. 
LDI has to, you, okay, you have to specify a constant that is resolvable at assemble time with LDI. But with LD, you are referring to a register. The value of a register changes at runtime, but the value of an immediate value is determined at assemble time, which means it does not change at runtime. Is that okay? All right. So what that means is when you do an LD here, we have no idea what is the value that the stack point is pointing to at runtime because it depends on what we push earlier. And as a result, even though we have a JMPB instruction on line 12 in both instances of calling and returning from function F, they can return to different spots. As opposed to a JMPI, has to return to exactly the same spot every single time, which does not work when you're returning from a function. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so with all this done, so I'm gonna save the TTP ASM program. Any additional questions before? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry? Um, not the assembly code. The C code is in the module itself, but the assembly code is also actually in the, uh, in the module. The module actually contains the assembly code. But I am constructing the assembly code you know, gradually in this particular example to kind of illustrate you know, what lines implement what in the C code. But it is in the, in the module already. So what is left for us to do is to run the assembly code. So now we can, uh, let me see, I can open up a different prompt, you know, keep that prompt around, and go to, this is when you want to have uh, Reverse Spider installed, because you know, that just makes it whole, a whole lot easier to do this. And I have to remember where I stashed that file, I think it's just in my root. Okay, so, nope, I guess not. There we go, okay. So this is what I need to do with uh, TTP, I mean, with River Spider installed. It will just kind of run the whole thing, you know, in batch mode. I don't have to interact. You know, it will actually do the assembling. It's trying to assemble right now. And it will come back and tell me whether the assembling is done correctly or not. If not, I have to fix the program first. So it said, you know, um, assembler finished, validating object code, object code is good. Starting the simulator, simulator string finished, submitting the trace data, and then when this returns to the command prompt, it means now I can switch back to the assembler to take a look at the trace. Okay, so this is like super handy. Um, the way you can run um, River Spider in Windows has already been discussed. There has, there's a video already released, so you need to kind of watch that video to learn how to do this in Windows. If you're on a Mac, or using Linux, then you know, this method would work. I mean, it, you don't have to install anything in addition to what you have already. All right, so now we are going to go back to the assembler, and I need to find out which tab the assembler is located, if there is one. Looks like I still got one that has the assembler tab, and I'm gonna put it into view over here. There we go. All right, so the assembler has the um, has a analysis tab. The analysis tab shows you how a program executes, and along the way, how memory content is changed, how memory content is retrieved, and also how registers are changed, as well as the flags register. The flag register is not useful in this case, so we can kind of ignore that. All right, so we, we're just gonna go through this line by line, okay? It is tedious, but it is necessary, okay? So this is how we can truly understand what does it mean when we say pushing the return address? What does it mean when we say we retrieve the return address? What does it mean when we have a JMP B in this case? And how do we call the function again and so on? So this is a really kind of tedious process but it is also a necessary process to understand how call and return are implemented in TTP ASM. Okay, no op does not do a single thing. Are you surprised? 
<laughs> All right, next instruction, LDID zero. Okay, register D got a value of zero. So this is why it's helpful because it shows you the result of executing every single instruction along with the actual source code, including the comments. So that makes it very obvious of what we are doing and what is the result of those instructions. JMPI to main, okay, and it continues execution at 0, 9 as a location, which I suspect is where main is. Now, anytime you go like, but I'm not really sure, okay, you know, how do I know that location 9 is where main is? In that case, you go to the assemble tab, and then you look up your know, main as a label, and then you look up the column W, that's right after the main you know, definition, it is location nine. Okay, so that means you, know, you can basically look between the tabs and figure out exactly you know, whether the program executed correctly or not. Okay, so now that we're in main, what are we supposed to do? Decrement D, this is the first step to push something on the stack. So the stack pointer was 00, zero which is also the same as 256. It is now decremented to FF, which is 255. Is that okay? Which indeed is the very last location of RAM, which is the top of the stack, okay? It is at the last location of the stack. Okay, what do we do next? Um, next, we have line 19, which is LDIC with first call to F returns here, which is just a label. That label turns out to be 0F. So the question is, is location 0F really corresponding to that specific label? If you don't trust the execution of the program, you can always go to the assemble tab and look up that label. So we are looking up the label definition a first call to F returns here, and you can see that it is indeed corresponding to location 0F. Okay, very good. Um, oh, this is not the, the right tab. Okay, there we go. Go to analysis tab. Not browser tab, but Google Sheets tab. There we go. So now location uh, register C has the value of 0F, and then what do we do next? STDC. In other words, we are asking register D to act as a pointer, and then we overwrite the location pointed to by register D, which is our stack pointer, with whatever content is in register C. So to reflect this operation, column C is saying whatever FF is at that location in RAM is now 0F, which is exactly what the code did. Are we doing okay so far, you know, reading the trace? Does everybody understand how to read the trace? What do the columns mean when you're reading the trace? The fly really likes me. It just doesn't know that I'm a really good debugger. <laughs> All right, so are we good so far? So this is also when, when you look through this trace, you might want to keep like a piece of paper so that you can, on that piece of paper, remember that location FF is now 0F because that comes in you know, handy later on. All right, so what do we do next? After we remember where to return to, then we can go like, okay, now let's go ahead and continue execution at the entry point of the function, which is function f in this case. So we have a JMPF, JMPI to f, which then continues execution at location five, okay, you know, which is the no op instruction, because I said, okay, just to emphasize that f has nothing to do, we'll put a no op there, that's the no op. Then we have the pop operation. The pop operation is the exact opposite of the push operation. So this one is basically saying, hey, stack, I know that the return address is supposed to be pushed. Um, can you get it for me? Okay, that's a pop operation. So it is going to whatever register D is pointing to, go to that location in RAM, retrieve that, and put it into register B. And that's what column B is representing. 
Note that this is an equal equal instead of a single equal. In other words, all column B is trying to indicate in this case is we are reading location FF, which has a content of 0F. That's what column B is trying to say. But column D is simultaneously saying that 0F, which is the content at location FF, is now being stored into register B. Are we, do, are we okay so far, understanding what column B is trying to indicate and what column D is trying to indicate? The columns have a header to tell you what it is supposed to be doing. Column B said RAM red, okay? Which RAM location is red and what is the content at that location? Column D says reg changed, which is basically saying which register is changed in the process and what it is changed to. So that's why you know, we, we look at these, these columns to understand what each line of code is doing. All right, so now we have uh, increment D because the content at location FF has now been retrieved. I don't need it on the stack anymore. But unlike a real stack of plates, you cannot just take a plate away and there, there are, there's one fewer plate in memory location, there's no such thing as taking a memory location away. All you can do is to change the stack pointer and say, yeah, that item is already retrieved, okay? This is the next item to retrieve. That's why you're changing the stack pointer. So we change the stack pointer by incrementing it so it goes from FF to 00. zero. Are we still doing okay so far? Tracking down the code? All right. So we'll do some scrolling here. So line 12 is actually the return instruction because now everything is set up, okay? The return address is in register B. The return address, which is 0F, is now in register B. JMPB, all it does is to say, whatever register B has is now whatever PC has. What is the job of PC again? What is the responsibility of PC? what code to fetch next, right? So you're correct. Eventually, it will become the code that we are going to execute next, but it changes you know, what code we are going to fetch in the next fetch cycle. So by changing the program counter to um, 0F, which is what this instruction is going to do, that means that we are continuing the execution of the program at location 0F, which is back to main, where the second call begins. Is that okay? So, um, so when we get back to main, the first thing we do is to push the second uh, return address. So we decrement D again. We load register C you know, based on the label of the second call to F returns here, which is a label. And then we push it, we store that onto the stack. And then we continue execution at the function being called. The function says, I got nothing to do. I'm going to retrieve the return address. And once the return address is retrieved, I need to, quote, unquote, remove it from the stack. And then we return to main again to the caller. The caller says, I got nothing else to do. We're done. So if you're not quite getting the details of this particular sample program right now, that's fine. Okay, you know, that's probably kind of normal because this is a lot of stuff that you need to kind of digest and relate. But this is the program that you need to kind of look at. The trace is one way to visualize what's happening. And understanding what each column in the trace is trying to tell you is also important. So I want to see if there are any questions before I move on to the next topic. So go ahead if you have any questions. It will return. It will store all the return addresses. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, we can make another sample program to illustrate it, where main calls f, f calls g, g calls h, and then g returns 
H returns to G, G returns to F, F returns to main. So how, how about that? Okay, let's, let's do that, okay? So before I move on, if you want to take a snapshot of this program, you can sign in you know, to um, your Google Drive you know, at apps.losreals.edu, go to the assembler that I use in this class, and then make a copy. So this way you have the source code in the source tab, and then you will also have the analysis tab corresponding to the execution of this program. Okay, so that would be a good thing to do, okay? And if you cannot do it right now, you'll make sure you know someone who can do it right now so that you can get a copy later on. So you're gonna have some time to do this because I'm working on the second sample program right now. So we'll call uh, this one nested call dot uh, C. So I'm gonna work on the C code first. So this time the C code is gonna be a lot more complicated because we have function G function H that doesn't do a single thing, then we have function G, and all it does is to call function H, and then we're gonna have function F, which, is, which has one important thing to do, which is calling function G, and then we have main, well, main has to return an int, and main has one important thing to do, which is calling F once, return zero, and we're done such a meaningful program. Ends up doing absolutely nothing, obviously. <laughs> okay, but before I move on, does everybody understand what this program is supposed to behave? In other words, in GDB, if you are to single step this program, do you know how the lines are supposed to progress? Okay, we start with line 17, it goes to line 12, then it goes to line seven, then it goes to line maybe three, go back to line eight, go back to line 13, go back to line 18, and we're done. Is that okay? Are we good so far? Okay. So now we try to write the assembly code corresponding to this. So we do a V split, okay? So we split the screen into two halves, and then on the right-hand side, I will write the code in um, TTP ASM. So this is nested, nested call.ttp ASM. All right, so kind of the same deal with a no-op because in order to use Rifa Spider, the entire program has to start with a no-op. That has to do with a bug, has to do with a bug in Logisim. And then we uh, do a LDI D with a zero, which is not really needed because it went Logisim starts all the registers are zeroed out to begin with, but it's good to understand that, yeah, you should probably initialize the stack pointer. Go to main, and I know we are quickly running out of time, but this is easy. Um, so we have H, and then the only thing it has to do is to do a LDB, I, can, I don't have to use register B, but just pick one. Increment D, uh, JMPB, uh, G is a little bit more complicated because we have to say LDI, some registers say A, and go like, you know, call to H returns here. Um, decrement D, S, T, D, A, and then put the call to H returns here as a label definition over here. And then we perform the same thing as H, so line six to eight, copy over here. All right, so function F, kind of the same deal. LDI A, call to G, call to G returns here. Decrement D, STDA, call to G returns here as a label definition, and then we just have to do the same usual return stuff, increment D, JMPB. So the only thing you have to make sure is whatever label, whatever register you use here is also gonna be the same register here. They can be register A, can be register B, can be register C. I just randomly pick register B in this case. All right, so get to main, kind of the same deal, okay? LDI A, 
uh, it doesn't have to be A. We can use any of the registers. Let's pick C. Uh, main call, okay, call to F returns here. Um, decrement D, S, D, D, C, and then JMPI to, oh, I forgot the JMPI earlier. Okay, I forgot a, bun a bunch of those JMPI. Because after we store the return address, that's when we need to call the function. So this needs to call, to, this has to continue execution in G, and then this one here has to continue execution in H. So I forgot those, those two, okay. And then the label definition is here, call to F returns here. But at this point, I have nothing else to do. So just a halt, you will finish up the program. All right, so, but you can see that even though this program is a little bit long, there's a pattern to it. The pattern itself is pretty, pretty simple, right? The, the pattern is if you need to call something, get the return address, push it on the stack, then continue execution at the function. If you are a function returning to the caller, then you retrieve the return address from the stack, clean it up, and then continue execution at the return address. That is the pattern. The program has a lot of redundancy here. But what I do want to illustrate is how the stack is being used, and this is actually truly illustrating why it is called a last in first out. So we'll get out of here, and then we'll just do a submit nest, nested call, because the TTPSM is nested call. And hopefully I did not make a mistake earlier. Okay, we'll see. Okay, so everything is good. It just takes a while to get back here. Okay, so now we are back. So the first thing I would do is to go all the way to the end, make sure that we end up at the halt instruction. It did that, it's good. The stack pointer goes back to zero, zero, so it's good. And in this case, you can see that more than one location on the stack is being used. So when you look at RAM write, the first location being used is FF, the second location used is 1.7, and the third location used is FD. That's because we have three nested calls. Every call uses one location on the stack to store the return address. I cannot reuse um, location FF because there's a nested call. If I reuse that location already, then there's no way I can return back to main. So I have to keep the return address to main when I'm calling from F to G. That return address has to stay put as function G is calling H because otherwise, Function, H can, function G cannot return to function F. So that's why, you know, um, when we are in function H, three locations on the stack are being used. And you can also see how the you know, register, um, how these are retrieved you know, one step at a time. So BE, I mean, this is retrieved first, and then FE is retrieved to here, and then location FF is retrieved to here. This is why it is last in, first out. So if you want to, you'll also take a snapshot of this code because this truly illustrates why a stack is needed. Why, why, can, why can't we just use a single location? Because you, know, that you can have nested calls. There are, um, okay, just, just to use a little bit more time, there are programming languages that do not use a stack, including COBOL, which is a really old programming language. So what it does is every function has a dedicated location to store the return address. In other words, um, I, you know, as a function, as a subroutine, I'd say, okay, if you are calling me, this is the location that you use so that I know where I'm supposed to return to. There's one problem with this approach. It works okay for normal, you know, you know, normal code, but it will not work when you have recursion. Because recursion is a function calling itself. 
So it's going to overwrite that very same location over and over again. So after the second call back to itself, it would have lost how to return to the actual caller. The stack doesn't have a problem because when you have recursion, it simply uses more and more locations. Yes, you'll be returning from the function back to itself. What is the problem? There's no problem with that. So that's why you know, the stack is really helpful is when you have functions that are recursive, it takes care of that problem automatically. Okay, so we do have a lab tonight. The lab is very related to what we just talked about. So I will give you the access code of the lab before the end, before I stop the recorder. And let's see here, that's not it. Okay, so this one is called stack operations. And the access code is LIFO, L-I-F-O, last in, first out. And I'm going to publish it right now. I will see all of you at the lab. All right.